serial entrepreneur who built or sold 24 businesses with adjusted sales ranging from $3 million to just under $4 billion. That's incredible. Currently CEO of All Channels Media LLC, principal and scale, scalable.co, digitalmarketer.com, traffic and conversion summit, praxio.com, trueconversion.com, war room mastermind, fully accountable, Everbowl restaurants, and Sony more scribe publishing. I think we all know these companies and love them. But Roland has a real passion for business and putting deals together, as always looking for businesses to invest in, or acquire, reposition, or even sell. So many recent strategic partnerships, including Microsoft, Southwest Airlines, and, and more. Acquiring and or partnering with entrepreneurs to scale businesses through acquisitions, acquisitions, strategic relationships, and marketing. Roland, we are so excited to have you. I am very thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. I think Roland is there. You go. If Roland was smart enough to hit his mute button, then uh, he would say he would have said, "Thank you very much. I'm very thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me." Roland, we're so honored having you here. If you could tell us a brief story, what was your journey like to get where you are? Okay. See, this is brand new for us. I did not mute myself. So everyone, yes. Yeah, so uh, Roland, if you could briefly share your, what was your journey like to, to get where you are? Oh gosh, uh, it, it was uh, from, from basically watching the really cool people that my father had come into his tax practice who were doing all kinds of different things. He was a tax attorney, still is actually. Um, and, um, and I got exposed to all these cool people that were doing everything that, that you might think of to make money. And they seemed really happy and they didn't go into an office and they were their own people and they worked for themselves and they didn't have to wear suits. And it was all really cool to see as a kid and um, from somebody that had developed a algorithm to trade stocks to somebody that was uh, doing gold mining and to people that owned horses that were racing them to to uh, a music store owner just just really watching all that and saying gosh that I want to be like those people they're really cool they 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 seem like they work for themselves do their own thing they they've got plenty of money and they don't answer to anybody other than themselves. I thought that was really, really cool. So um, that led me to be interested in that. And then um, from finding Dennis Waitley's Psychology of Winning in the back of my dad's car to uh, him telling me, you got to check out this, this guy, Tony Robbins and his crazy book, Unlimited Power and reading that and d diving into NLP. I was um, really blessed as a kid to, to be exposed to all that. So, um, so I got on the motivational track pretty early and was pretty obsessed with uh, devouring everything that I could about that. Got into, I got my real estate license when I was 18, insurance license when I was 19, was doing securities deals with a securities license when I was 20, started doing lots of developments in real estate. Um, that led to, did about uh, 10,000 houses across the, the Eastern United States down into the Cayman Islands and then hooked up with Prudential Securities in New York, was doing leverage buyouts through the 80s, buying and selling companies, thought that was pretty amazing as I was going through and getting an accounting degree and going to law school, then um, continued, uh, opened my law practice, started doing deals with clients and uh, never really looked back. It's uh, I, I love, love, love business, very passionate about that, got about uh, 38 companies in my portfolio that are currently um, in different verticals and then lots of companies under that and, you know, loving, loving the journey. It's just really great. Man, I can tell your excitement, all those businesses. Now, Roland, can you share as your first deal ever? Yeah, as best I can remember, the, the first deal that I did was a real estate deal and it was a land entitlement deal. So basically um, I was, I, I started as a real estate agent and I wanted to be able to leverage myself. So rather than going out and getting onesie twosie listings from people and trying to sell houses, I was like, well, who has a bunch of them? And um, I was like, well, real estate developers, They're, they have lots of listings. So maybe I can go do something with them. So I got turned down a whole lot by a lot of them, but I finally found one that said, yeah, I, I would love to have you sell my properties for me. That would be fantastic. And so I was like, okay, that's cool leverage. If I can find somebody that's already 
got everything that I want so that I don't have to keep going out and doing it again and again, and I have one source, that would be really cool. Um, ultimately, I decided it's good to have lots of sources of people that have lots of aggregated customers for you. But um, but anyway, uh, with him, I was able to start selling, and then I found out, I was like, how do you do this business? It's pretty cool. You, you buy land and then apparently do some magic with the government, and then you're able to sell, sell it for a whole lot more than you got it to a whole lot of people. And uh, he was like, yeah, I, I go, and I buy land in the direction that cities are growing. And then I get a, uh, I file to get the land changed from whatever it's zoned as to be able to sell lots. I put in water and sewer on those lots and then I sell them to developers who then take the risk of building the property. And I was like, well, that's really cool. And so we did that. My first deal, I was like, well, can I invest with you? And he said, sure. And so I put $19,000 in it took about six to nine months. Um, I want to say it was like nine months. And um, I made double my money in that time. And I was like hooked. I was, this is so cool. I, I like really just magic. I can put my money into this deal and get twice as much back. And, you know, I'm 18 years old, 19 years old at the time, just saying this is the best thing since sliced bread. And at the time I was playing out in clubs in a band. So I'd make, you know, thousand dollars a week or so doing that. Um, and this, I made $19,000 just in like not having to do much of anything. I was like, this is really, really cool. So that was, that was really my first deal. Wow. I love it. Now, can you know, you tell us the story behind the epic a challenge? I was able, I, it was, it was awesome for me to be able to join it last year. year. Start so doing the lockdown. I have to say that so inspired that we were able to acquire and open businesses through that. Can you tell us the story about the That's the so I'm sorry, you cut out for just a minute because one of my business partners was trying to call me. Say say that one more time. Sorry, I apologize for that. No worries. So can you tell us the story about the backstory of the epic challenge? How did it end up being the epic challenge? Because, because I was able to experience that last year during the lockdown. During the lockdown I, had to say, I, was I was able to, to open businesses, businesses and for a little bit and sell practicing. So tell us more about it. It's really cool. So um, that happened as a result of the pandemic and a pivot that I made. So I was, um, I, I've always been very passionate about business and I've learned a whole bunch of cool stuff and I am an active person who does deals. So one of the things to do deals, to buy and sell companies, you need to have connections with entrepreneurs. And so one of the ways that I do that is I teach entrepreneurs how to leverage, find leverage in their business, scale it, grow it, and then exit it. And what's really cool about exiting that a lot of people don't think about is if you're trying to think about how to compound wealth and there's a, a way that you can do that where you would get paid several years of the profits of your business all in one shot, all in one year, and then you could go out and do that again, that's pretty magical in terms of building wealth because let's because businesses sell for multiples of profits. So uh, the average business let's say sells for about five times its annual profit. So that means each time you sell a business, you can make five years of profits in a single year. If you do that and you go out and you buy another business and a few years later you sell that and you do that again, over a period of say 15 or 20 years, you can be 20, 30 years of income ahead of somebody that just held on to their business the whole time. And you can use the money that you get from selling the business to buy even more, uh, even larger businesses. So I, I identified, I was like, man, I, I can hold on to my business for a long time and that's great. But the same business that would make me say a hundred thousand or a million dollars a year, I can sell for 500,000 or 5 million or, or more depending on the industry. And so if I, if I take a business that's doing that's making me $100,000 a year and I sell it for $500,000 and I do that five times over a 20 year period, I'd be two and a half million dollars ahead of myself if I had only held on to it. But when you add leverage to it and compounding of interest, that number gets to be just something that nobody's gonna actually believe. So I was like, well, that's, that's really interesting. So 
I want to be in a position where I can find lots of businesses to sell. So I, I teach all of the things that I've learned about buying, selling, growing, finding leverage in businesses, building strategic relationships, finding new profit centers, strategic, you know, all of those kinds of things. And, um, and I was doing it to small groups all over the world, um, about 20 to 25 people at a time. And so when the pandemic hit, I, I was literally sitting in a hotel about 15 minutes from where I live about to do one of those events and California shut down and they said no more events. So I had to send the people home that had come to do that. And I was like, wow, that really, that really stinks. Um, I want to be able to, I want to be able to help these people. And I also want to find a way to continue to spread the message. And so a friend of mine, um, Pete Vargas, who's a brilliant guy who, if you ever want to learn how to speak, you should check out his advance your reach company. And another guy, Pedro Adeo, who, um, had been doing challenges and Pedro is a guy worth looking at too, because he's, they, they had been doing these things with Tony Robbins, who was a former client of mine when I was practicing law. And, and I've, I've been on his stage as, as one of the folks mentioned when, when they were doing the intros here a few times. And um, what, what uh, those guys said is they said, we have been the number one affiliate for Tony Robbins on his events and Dean Graciosi. And we've done these challenges and they're great. You get people online for five days, you take them through a journey, you deliver a really specific, great result for them. And, um, and then if they want to continue with training, you know, you, you make that offer to them and it's really cool. And so, um, I was like, okay, well that, that sounds cool. And I, I had just hired a new, uh, a new guy that was my director of marketing. And so I had that one guy and uh, Deanna Rogers, who is my my right hand, my CEO. And um, I said, let's let's do this challenge thing, because it seems like we can help a whole lot of people and reach a lot of people. And we can't do anything at hotels anymore or live events. So let's do it virtually. And um, they said, OK, great. When do you want to do it? And I said, how about Thursday? And they were like, Thursday. And I was like, yeah, Thursday, let's do it. Let's, if we're going to do this, let's do it. I love taking action really, really fast on anything that I'm going to do. So we, we did that. I completely rewrote the program. I focused only on one part because I didn't want to overwhelm people with all of the aspects of buying, selling, growing, leveraging, exiting. And I focused on how to acquire companies with little or no money out of pocket. Um, that's something I've been doing for um, over... 35 years now. And, um, I've done, you know, over a thousand exits and acquisitions, uh, uh, and helped people with, with those as well. And so I've got a lot of experience with it. And I, I've, I've developed about 220 ways to acquire businesses with no money down. And so I was like, I'm going to try this. I'm going to share that with people. I'm going to see how it goes. And so we, uh, ran ads for five days we launched, we did our challenge. Um, we did about $870,000 in sales um, in that roughly seven days of advertising and seven days of delivering. So we're in roughly 14 days. And we were able to help over a thousand people learn how to do this in the challenge. And then we also offered them the ability to, to have additional support if they wanted to do it. So I've been doing that now for, I'm in my 15th round of it. Um, we've had tens of thousands of people that have gone through the challenge um, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them that have closed deals. And uh, so I get messages every day from people that are like, I bought my first company with no money out of pocket and it's just magic and it's changed my life. And that's really, really cool. So the, the good that came out of uh, something that would be otherwise, you know, there's certainly been plenty of bad that's come from the pandemic. The good has been that it enabled me to say, hey, I can actually reach a wider audience and share these strategies and techniques with them on how to acquire these companies with no money out of pocket, which by the way, helps all of the businesses, the 600,000 roughly businesses a year that simply close their doors and the three to 4 million businesses a year that want to sell that cannot, it's helping all of them find a way to exit their businesses to the folks that I'm teaching these strategies to. So it's it's really been very rewarding and exciting to be able to do. I love it. Can you share at least a two strategies, your favorite strategies, how to acquire companies with barely no money down? 
What are your two favorite? Sure. Yeah. The, there's. I mean, there's a there's a lot of them. That I'd say that that the place to start is the simplest. And so a, a lot of people think that you need to go out and get investors or credit loans or things like that. Um, the very first thing that I would say is that it's very important if you're thinking about doing anything like this to not create any kind of exposure or personal liability for yourself, not to put your personal credit on the line, not to have any risk that anything that you do to acquire the business could come back and create liability for you, your family, your other businesses or anything like that. The way that you do that is through a thing called a special purpose vehicle. That's also typically known in our industry as an SPV. And what that is, is any entity, it could be, depending on where you are in the world, it can be a, a, a PTY, you know, an LLC, an LP, uh, a, a, an INC, you know, a subchapter S, a C corporation, any of those things. It, there, there isn't anything that you go to whoever forms entities for you at, at the government, wherever you're located, and you say, I want an SPV, they're going to be like, I don't know what that is, because they don't. An SPV is simply any entity that has limited liability like a corporation or a limited liability company that you use for a specific purpose. In our case, the specific purpose we're going to use it for is to acquire either the assets of or the equity of another company. So that's, that's the first thing in terms of, um, I think, an overarching strategy is that you want to do this through an entity like an SPV. When you do that then, Two of my favorite strategies, which are the simplest of all of them, uh, and it's it's the place I start, by the way, is seller financing. So just as within real estate or anything that you might buy, you, you can offer a seller a purchase price and say, hey, I want to buy this for X dollars or rand or pounds or euro or whatever, wherever you are, and, um, and I'm going to let you finance it for me. And so I'll typically offer, an, let's say I'm offering a million dollars for a business. I'll typically start with my offer as an 80% seller financed deal. And I'm going to say, I'll, I'll pay you $800,000 over seven years is a very common period of time. And um, I don't talk about interest. I don't offer interest. It may, may be that we ultimately negotiate that there are some, but I would say, almost all of my deals are simply a number with no interest. Um, and I talk with the seller about collaborating to get them their price. So I want to say, what's the price that you want for it? And they say, I want a million dollars. I'm like, great. I'm going to work with you to try to get you that million dollars. So the law of price and terms says that if it's your price, which we've decided is a million dollars, you just told me that, then it's going to be the terms that I want because I'm, I'm already giving you your price. I'm not gonna haggle with you or negotiate on that price. Okay, great. So then the first thing that I'd like to do is I'd like for you to help me finance 80% of that by you carrying the paper or accepting a promissory note, uh, a mortgage, if you will, on the business for, uh, for 80% of it. And then the balance, the other 20%, I'd like to pay you as an earn out. And an earn out, means that we agree that if the business does, if, if the business performs at a certain level over a certain period of time, both of those are negotiable, then I'm going to pay you an additional amount. So the way that that might look on, on the deal that we're talking about here is, hey, here's the deal. I'll pay you a million dollars because that's what you want. You give me financing for 80% of it. That's 800,000. And um, let's just say I negotiate eight years on that. I'll give you a hundred. Uh, I'll give you a uh, hundred thousand a year for eight years because that's easy math. That's very simple. You get your you're getting your eight hundred thousand dollars there. A hundred thousand dollars a year for eight years. Fantastic. Great. The other two hundred thousand I will give you over two years as long as the business continues to perform at the level it's performing now. So that helps me because if for some reason the business is not going to perform as well because you leave, then I'm protected. If it doesn't perform as well, I don't pay you that 200,000. But if it does, then I do. So we're effectively having the seller share the risk of continued performance with us. So that's two strategies, seller financing and earnout, that I would use 
to start pretty much any conversation. And keep in mind that what I said a few minutes ago about this special purpose vehicle, because I'm going to acquire this business using that special purpose vehicle, I won't be on the line if that 800,000 can't be paid. If that 200,000 earnout gets hit and I can't pay it for whatever reason, if the company doesn't perform, I'm not liable for paying the million dollars. The SPV is liable for paying that. And that's really, really important when you're doing these kinds of deals. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't remember your DVP before down payment. See, I pay attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now, Roland, what kind of interest industry is like super attractive to you at this point? Yeah, that's that's really good. So, uh, question: the there are several. So right now, my game is that not only do it. So so first off, let me just say. I, I am interested in buying profitable businesses. I'm not interested in buying businesses that are broke, that are losing money or that need to be turned around. And there are millions and millions of businesses out there that are profitable that you can acquire. So I don't want to, I have done lots of turnarounds, but you don't have to do that. It's significantly harder than buying a profitable business. So I'm first off starting about acquiring a profitable business. Um, then, I'm interested in saying, okay, well, what, what industries do I think there will be an acquirer in? Because as we talked about earlier, my interest is not just to own a profitable business, to be, but to be able to sell it to somebody else for several years of profit, that multiple of profits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, what are the industries right now that I think that I would enjoy that I have either expertise in myself currently, or I can partner with somebody that knows the business. So I'm not going in blind. And then that are selling for the higher multiples. So right now, there are a few businesses that are really, really appealing to buyers. And the buyers of these businesses, they take several different forms. There's about 35,000 private equity firms um, that are basically companies that raise money from wealthy individuals and wealthy other companies and pension funds and things like that, and then buy and sell companies. Um, those are called private equity funds or private equity firms. There are now companies called SPACs, which are special purpose acquisition companies that are blind pool public companies, meaning that they raise a ton of money, billions of dollars, and then they don't know what they're going to buy. Then they go out and find something to buy. There are family offices, which are set up by very, very ultra high net worth individuals, people that uh, like the, the people that founded Google or Elon Musk or those people. Typically, all of those wealthier people have a family office, which is effectively a fund that they use to invest their wealth. And then there are corporate buyers that are interested in acquiring as well. And these corporate buyers are have billions or actually there's about two, two and a half trillion dollars in those companies right now. So across all of these companies, you're looking at between five and eight trillion dollars in what we call dry powder, meaning cash that they can use to to buy companies. So what I'm going to do when I'm thinking about what am I going to acquire is I'm going to say, well, what are they looking to acquire? So right now, the industries that they're looking to acquire are Amazon, FBA companies. FBA companies are fulfillment by Amazon e-commerce companies that sell physical products on Amazon. There's about 5 million companies that are selling on Amazon in the marketplace right now that are not Amazon. They make up a lot of the sales, the total sales of Amazon, and Amazon takes a fee for doing that. Well, right now, those companies are super hot. There are funds that have been formed like Thrasio, which is one of the fastest companies to ever reach a billion dollar valuation, um, Perch and several others that have raised billions of dollars just for the sole purpose of acquiring e-commerce companies that sell on Amazon. So if I can look at the world of those 5 million sellers and find some that fit the criteria that I think would be appealing to private equity that's just falling all over themselves to pay crazy valuations for those businesses right now, that's a great place for me to look. Another place would be SaaS companies. Software as a service companies right now, if they are about, it, it, this, this varies at any given moment, but 
a larger software as a service company that's doing say a million a month in annual recurring revenue, meaning that they have uh, contracts with their customers. So they're providing software on a, on an annual basis and it's a million dollars a month or more. And they're retaining their people at about a rate of 96% every month, meaning they're only losing about 4% of those people a month. They typically now, uh, depending on the industry of the SaaS, are trading in the 10 to 25 times revenue, uh, times that annual recurring revenue. And so that's very appealing because there's a huge demand for those companies. Smaller ones are trading at around three to 10 times uh, trailing 12 months TTM revenue. Um, so that's that's really an interesting segment for me too. Other industries that are interesting right now are cybersecurity. All of the attention that's been drawn from the malware attacks that are coming from other countries and um, the Colonial Pipeline and the meat company and those kinds of things, that's been um, very interesting to private equity, family offices, those types of companies. Um, and then there are strategic acquisitions in industries that you see experiencing great growth. So Blackstone just invested, um, uh, I think it was $6 billion to acquire uh, 180,000 homes. I think that was what it was. Um, that, that lack of supply that exists in real estate right now, we're, last time I looked about 5.6 million homes short of the demand. So there's going to be a lot of high valuations that are coming everywhere from the supply chain to the actual end builder of, of homes uh, in the real estate. So that's an interesting area for me. So I look at what, where is there a supply and demand um, opportunity to find the people, to find companies and industries where the private equity firms, corporations, um, SPACs and family offices are looking to acquire. And I'm trying to acquire those companies less expensive and then flip them out to those, those companies that are trying to buy those. Does that make sense? I know that's a lot of information. Yeah, I know. That's amazing. And I know you have like a five year turnaround and you exited those companies that you acquired. Why, Why five, five years? years? So you can do it way quicker. Um, and, and we have, but, but really, I'm leaving money on the table, I find, if I go less than about three. So I'd say three to six years is the average hold for me on companies. I know um, uh, one of the ones that I talk about a lot is in 2013, I acquired an interest in a company called Idea Incubator. And Idea Incubator owned several businesses that were all in one. Uh, it owned a bunch of websites that were selling things online. It owned an e-learning company called Digital Marketer. It owned an, a live event called Traffic and Conversion Summit. And um, over several years, so I, I've owned that now for what, for eight years. And we've exited three of those companies because that one company that I acquired, and this is really what I look for these days, is I saw that there were about six or seven exits that were possible within that company. And a mistake that I see a whole lot of people make that own successful companies is that they sell the company to the first company, to the first investor that comes along and makes an offer. They're like, oh, okay, I got one on the line. Let's see what I can do to sell that company. Well, number one, they're not going through an auction process where they're gonna get significantly more almost every time. Um, by having several companies bid to see who actually wants it the most. But, um, but beyond that, they typically sell the one thing that that acquirer is interested in, in buying. But the value of that one thing to that buyer is all that buyer is looking for. Yet, there is very often, as was the case in Idea Incubator, there are several things that the buyer of that one thing has no interest in at all. And they typically don't sell those things. They just stop doing that part of the business. So for example, the, the first exit of um, that idea incubator company was a water filter company that we acquired after I got in. Um, that water filter company, if we had just sold that with the business, we would have missed out on all kinds of opportunity to exit the other businesses. Now, in fairness, that was not really related 
that much. It was related to the e-commerce companies that we had there because it was a supplier to them, but it wasn't part of the like digital marketer um, uh, traffic and conversion summit. So I'm going to only talk about that. Here's the deal though. Digital marketer owned at that time, dozens of very profitable e-commerce sites. We ultimately spun those off and sold them to another big company called Agora. We then had the event that was part of the company, but was considered a small part of the company. But we were able to identify that Blackstone Corporation, which is one of the biggest funds in the world, owned an event acquisition company called Clarion. And we sold that event without selling digital marketer to that company. And so that was in 2018. We were able to sell that at a really, really great deal. And, um, and along the way, we spun out some of the other companies that digital marketer owns. So now we currently have digital marketer. We, we, so we've done three exits. We've got digital marketer that's still in the, actually we have several people that would like to buy that right now. So it wouldn't surprise me if we don't have a deal on that before the end of the year. Um, we have uh, our mastermind, the war room, which another Blackstone company has a, an option on to acquire. We have um, our, True Conversion software, our Praxio software, our Recess software, which um, I uh, can't talk about what's going on with, but uh, wouldn't be surprised if someone isn't already uh, in the process of acquiring that. And so we end up with probably in that single company, um, we'll probably end up in the neighborhood of nine or 10 exits. And so a lot of people, when they get that first interest in, in having a company that, uh, that is interested in buying them, don't think about, well, how can I actually turn this into three, five, seven, ten different exits? Does that make sense? And I don't know if that yes, completely absolutely. answers your it's question. It's kind of like your solar system, but you have like the sun and the planet. I think I heard it from you and um, what's his name? One of your partners, digital marketer, mentioned the solar system. Ryan Dice, I, yeah. Ryan Dice, yeah, I was so inspired by that. Now, Roland, who can do all this buying and selling businesses who's qualified to do this well that's the cool thing is that that in in the past it's been the really wealthy pension funds and wealthy investors corporations that make a lot of money uh family offices where someone has sold a company for a whole lot of money uh typically a hundred million or more and um and then public companies but um, what my goal is really in the stuff that i teach is how do we democratize that how do we make mergers and acquisitions and growth by acquisition and the ability to flip companies, something that is available to everyone, just like flipping houses is. And so to me, anyone can do this because if you use no money out of pocket strategies, and we talked about one that anybody here could take and use, I've done it a lot of times with simply the earnout and the seller finance. Um, but the, the idea is that you don't need a ton of money. Um, you don't need any cash at all, really to do a lot of deals. And so that's been for me, something I've been doing for decades now and sharing that and watching other people do it is, is super cool. Wow, so if you wanna find out, can you can do a reset, reset where, can where can they, they find more about Roland's mastermind? Of course, of course, yeah, this is just incredible. Roland, every time you talk about this, I just learn something new. Our head hurts. <laughs> well, I hope I don't want your head to hurt. I want you to, to understand there's this is absolutely possible. And we have hundreds and hundreds of people doing these deals, which is really exciting because, you know, uh, there's a thing going on right now. And I'll, Dan, I'll let you do your thing and then let me talk about the great resignation for a minute. If, if I may, I, I hate to interrupt. I never do when there's a speaker on stage. This is Edna. But I have to share this case. I took Roman's course. And it was flippant, amazing. Fast forward, some of the stuff I wrote about a month ago, I closed on a deal where it was no money out of pocket, uh, cash out for something that I needed to, that was a critical component to the, my solar business and what I needed. And some of the strategies that Roman shared in his course, I was able to use and bought bought him out and it was no cash out of pocket and it's owner finance with buyout based on production and sales and it was just a sweet deal and so 
I don't think I would have been able to do that had I not taken Roman's course. Uh, no I wonder, wonder why you're buying all this uh, website that you mentioned to me. That's from Roland. I can That's so that great on. to hear. I, I'm so happy to hear that you're doing that. That that just and, makes my heart happy. And this is this is at the same role that I took your course. I don't know. It's in the middle of the height of the pandemic. It's right after. Maybe April or May. I remember, Edna. I remember you asked great, great questions. <laughs> yes, yes. It was about a year ago, and I was like, okay. And I started the negotiations back then, and it took me almost a year to to get it done. A year and a few months, but I was able to get it done, and I was very strategic. And so, I just want to thank you because the th the things that you teach people are flipping amazing, and and just the strategy and the way you break it down, it's so easy to follow. And I, I strongly encourage anybody who is who's who's on the fence, like this is definitely a game changer because you can learn how to buy and leverage and get and acquire companies without like having to put a whole bunch of money up front. So that is I so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, Dan, can you, I, I, just I just wanted to let you guys know what we're doing, doing live, live here through, through LinkedIn, LinkedIn Facebook, and Facebook, Facebook and Instagram. And Instagram. So, so you, you're, you're seeing us live right, right now. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I know, right? This is the first time Oh, sorry. This is the first time I forgot to uh, unmute myself as well. It's the first time that we we actually span all uh, all social media here and had people on watching live and on the stream. This is incredible. But thank you, Edna, for that. That that's exactly what we also experienced in that. And I have so many questions. I know the audience has so many questions because I'm getting a ton of messages in the back channel. But this is how to run a successful business with Roland Frazier how to buy businesses, no money down, no money out of pocket. If you wanna check out more, just so everybody can have a quick look, WMB, it's W, the letter M, the letter B, WMB.club. That'll go directly to Roland's site. And then you can learn more about everything that he's talking about. It is one of the best things that you will ever do for yourself. I know a lot of people on here that have also gone through the courses and it's really, really incredible. And we hardly ever talk about people's courses on here. But Roland, we know yours is legit. So WMB.club, check it out. But this is Roland Frazier. Back to you, Kate. Yeah, no, no, Roland, you're, you're saying something about what is a risk nation or something? Go ahead. Something about, oh, uh, the great resignation. Yeah. So I was just going to say one thing that's going on right now that I think is really exciting is that we're getting. Uh, a tremendous amount of people. Um, I think that there were two different studies. One was Microsoft that said 41% of the people who are at their jobs right now are not happy with that and thinking about leaving. And another one that said 95%. And I think that was really, really interesting that there's a lot of people that have been accepting what was available that's out there for work, particularly in industries like the hospitality and restaurant industry, where they're working for a minimum wage, which is lower than than is acceptable for them to make a living. And a lot of them during the great the, during the this last pandemic were able to stop working. They had to. Um, and then they received some government from different countries uh, support that enabled them to kind of say, wait a minute, I'm OK right now. Is that what I want to do with my life? Do I want to go back to that job that I didn't like, that didn't appreciate me, that didn't treat me the way that I deserve to be treated and that didn't make me what I needed to make to make a living? Um, no, I don't. And so they're calling it the great resignation that all these people are leaving. And you see that if you go out into hospitality and restaurants right now, a lot of them are, are really drastically understaffed because all the people that used to work there and get paid next to nothing now don't want to do that anymore. So here's what's cool about that. A lot of those people are starting new businesses. And so starting businesses are really, really hard. And the failure rate is very, very high. It's 90%. Um, or higher as you go into more and more years. So my hope is that for anybody that's listening or watching that has said, I want better. I don't want to go back to what was before. I'm not happy with that status quo and I'm not happy with where that was taking me. I want to have what we're doing here, show them that without 
hitting their credit cards without having to invest uh, tons of money or have a bunch of investors or expose themselves or their personal wealth uh, and assets to risk, they can actually go out and acquire a business that's already profitable that they can own and that they can work in that business instead of working for somebody else, that they can decide what they want to make and be paid instead of letting somebody else do that. And so that's to me, very, very motivating to help people understand this opportunity is tremendous. And there's a whole lot of businesses, millions and millions and millions out there all over the world in any place that you happen to live. And these strategies are something that you can use anywhere. They're not specific to the United States or the UK or Canada or the EU or Australia or wherever you happen to be. They are just general business things that you can do. So that's really important to me that people understand that. And now I'll shut up. <laughs> I love it. Dan, do you have a question for Roland? Let's go do Q&A. Dan, go ahead. Yes, we're going to the Q&A. I know we have a few people that have messaged me. And first up would be Paul and then Courtney. And then we can go from there. So, Paul, do you want to ask first? Awesome. I just want to say that. Uh, I, I, I'm with a session center that I looked into a couple of um, videos and just did some research because I wasn't that familiar about the activity was mixed with other folks. Uh, but something that caught my attention was the, the MRR, the monthly recurring revenue. And that is something that I was interested in because it hasn't really been focused on in my business. So the question I have for you is are there some general tips that can apply to many businesses where owners or Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a really great question. The, the idea MRR stands for monthly recurring revenue. And so what, what investors are looking for, and, and actually even as an operator, so this is something just generally to consider is that, that whatever you want to do with your business, whether you want to hang on to it forever, or you want to sell it to somebody else, the things that you do that make it appealing to a potential buyer will only make it more valuable to you if you keep it. So if you decide to sell or not sell isn't really the issue when we're talking about things like MRR, it's that no matter what you do, this will make your business better. So the idea behind this is risk-based. So the, the less that you have to do every single month to generate revenue and profits for your business, the better. If you could have the, the sale of the, whatever the business sells and the profits that generate happen automatically, then that would reduce the risk to you because you don't have to go out and make new sales next month. Uh, all your expenses plus profits could be covered from these recurring sales. And for an investor, it makes it less risky, meaning that they're willing to pay more for a business that has automatic sales than one that has to go out and find new people to sell to every month. So that's the, the benefit of MRR is that it provides you with guaranteed sales and profits every single month. So when you're looking at your business and you say, okay, I don't have that right now. I have static sales, meaning I've got to go out every single month and find new people to buy my products or services so that, that I can pay the bills and make a profit and, um, and make a living. Then uh, the thing to do is to say, okay, well, what can I do to create this MRR? And there are several things. The easiest that most people don't think about is how do I simply put on auto bill or auto ship, whatever they're buying. So if you've got any kind of product right now that is something that people buy more than once, particularly if it's a consumable product, something that they, they use up. Now that might be uh, um, anything from uh, a, a uh, simple thing like soap uh, to something uh, that's complicated like uh, software credits or the ability to use software during a month in a SaaS. That, that monthly recurring revenue, that fact that that thing is consumed, that they're going to reorder, if you can automate that process by putting it on auto ship or on auto rebuild, 
then that's going to create monthly recurring revenue. And you can do it annually as well. And then it's called annual recurring revenue. They're, either one is great. Uh, so that's, that's the first thing. If you don't have something right now that people buy more than once, maybe you sell cars and people don't typically buy cars every single month, you know, hopefully. Um, the, the idea there would be, how could I turn that into monthly recurring revenue? Well, interestingly enough, Porsche and Cadillac and several other car companies have done that. And so they've got programs where they say, pay this much a month for a car and every month after that, and you can trade that car in any time and get another car. As a matter of fact, we'll drive it over to your house and park it there. So if you want to drive a uh, Cabriolet one month and a Targa the next and uh, a Panamera the next, that's okay. You just pay this much every month. Um, what about clothes? Rent the Runway says you can actually get to, to a point where you can do new clothes every single month, right? Um, Apple says, how about you rent your phone and get a new phone whenever you want to? So there's all these things now where we're taking things that were previously considered to be one-time sales and turning them into monthly revenue that recurs, which ultimately makes those companies more value, more valuable. The other thing you can do is you can do it with a service. So one of the biggest profit centers for Amazon is Prime. We have hundred over 130 million, last time I looked, people that pay for Amazon Prime just so they can get stuff shipped to them a little bit faster for free. And for Amazon, it's become one of their biggest profit centers. So there's like, no matter what you sell, the ability to think about how can I turn that into something that is a product, even if it's a service, a, 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 the way to, to productize a service is to say, these are the standard seven things that this service is, or five or three or however many there are. And it's the, it's the same across everything. Then say, how can I provide that to my customers every single month? That's really the magic of doing that. SaaS software as a service is a great way to do that. Um, box products so that you're saying, I'm going to ship you a box of these products every single month. BarkBox does that. Stitch Fix does that. There's a lot of companies that do that. You could form a club or association like a buyer's club. Um, uh, Price Club uh, has done that. Excuse me. Is it Price? Price Club? Price Club has done that. There's a lot of others, Costco, that have those kinds of things where there's the ability to be a buyer and you can only be a buyer if you pay this monthly fee. Their newsletters, which are super popular right now, Agora, who bought one of our companies, is very good at this. They have 50 to you know multi-thousand dollar newsletters that they sell and those renew every single year. So no matter what you do, you can think about how do I turn this into something that I could actually get paid for every single month and deliver great value to my customer every single month. Awesome. You're very welcome. Wow. Incredible. Thank you, Roland. I just want to make sure how much more time do you have? Because I think we only had you for another two minutes. What, whatever you need, I am here to serve. You <laughs> are awesome. We could be open 24 hours. So uh, <laughs> you got to be careful on Clubhouse. Well, if, you, if you see me falling asleep on the side, then, then we're going <laughs> okay. too long. If you fall oh, over them. Uh, well, yeah, let's maybe another half hour if, if, that's, uh, if that's enough for you. Uh, whatever, whatever you need, I'm happy to help. All right, that is yeah. so awesome. We have we got you a screaming eagle. Um, uh, I'm I'm ship, sending it to you, um, Roland. I'm sorry. Oh, I think someone. I said I'm shipping you the screaming eagle. <laughs> okay, I love that. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, in case people just joined, I know we had a lot of people. This is Roland Fraser here. Such an incredible human being, incredible, the smartest person in business. That's quoted by a lot of people on here. So it's not him saying it about himself. That's what people say about Roland Frazier. He is really incredible. We've learned so much today. And I know we took your challenge over a year ago. We learned in a ton. It helped us on acquiring assets. It literally is the reason why we're here. The reason why we're here, why we created this club was actually what we learned from over a year ago when we took that challenge. I think it was back in April. So uh, it's really, really changed our life, not just that challenge, but many other things that we learned from you. But if you want to learn more, it's WMB, that's W, like what it takes, M, like million, B, like business. So WMB.club, real simple, really short. Go to that. 
It'll automatically forward you to Roland Frazier so you can see all the things that we're talking about. You can check it out for yourself because it is really, really an incredible program. I know a lot of people here have taken it. Um, but beyond that, too, we're just super happy that Roland was here today. So a couple of people here wanted a question. I know Frederick had wanted to ask. So, Frederick, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. Sure. So, so first, I, I want to point out that that you can do, uh, and and I don't really like to talk about deals as no money down because there's very often money that is down in a deal. It's just that it's not coming out of your pocket. So, where our goal is, how do we have the business pay for itself? Or how do we access resources that will not make us come out of pocket? So that that's an important distinction, I think, just just so everybody understands. But to answer your question, um, the largest deal that I'm aware of that one of our folks has done no money out of pocket so far is eighty nine million dollars. So that's a pretty significant deal to do without having to come out of pocket any money. And that was for a company that was making twenty million dollars a year in profit. So that like as a benchmark, that's kind of a cool place to start with respect to what you're saying about the SBA. For those of you who are not in the United States or those of you who don't know, the SBA is the Small Business Administration. It's a governmental or quasi governmental agency in the United States that guarantees loans for its member banks. So it's a place that entrepreneurs can go to get loans to acquire different companies and do other things. There's typically about seven types of loans that the SBA issues. If the loan that you're going after is in excess of $25,000, you will most likely have to personally guarantee it, meaning that if you don't pay the loan back, they can come after your income and other personal assets to do that. So I don't like using SBA loans because of that if I need more than $25,000 to do something. It is great in that it is available money. Um, it's not impossible to qualify for like some bank loans are. It is unfortunately something that typically does take a lot of time to do. Three months would be fast. Six months, I think, would be about average. Um, but it is a viable way to finance these deals. And so as a part of what I call the deal stack, I like to, to, to call whatever we need to get to buy this company uh, the deal stack. And so there are slices that we can add that ultimately, if we snap together little financing strategies like Lego blocks, we ultimately build our way up to paying whatever it is that we need to pay for the company. So the SBA loan would be one of those building blocks. And I have about 220 of those building blocks right now. So I could use an SBA loan and I could snap it together with some seller financing and I could snap that together with an earnout and then some more strategies and do it. So I think it's, it's a great strategy. And as long as you're comfortable with the exposure that you have, there's nothing wrong at all with using it. But I do think that there are a lot of other strategies that that don't require you to come out of pocket um, in terms of a personal guarantee that that might also fit. And so I would consider those other strategies, which you've been through the program, so you know several of them, um, before I would go with the SBA. Does that make sense? So say that one more time, just so I can be sure I answer the right question. So uh, what, what, what is a, um, a, good, a good model for you looking for in terms of maybe ratio uh, of revenue MRR per month? How much money does a company need to be cash flowing? So yeah, it, it totally depends on, on what your reason for acquiring the company is. So if it's a platform company, 
meaning that you're just acquiring it because it's the first thing that you're acquiring, then to me, it just has to be making enough money to allow you to get whatever you want from the deal to be able to weather, say, a 20 to 30 percent potential reduction in the profits that it's making and also then to provide the money that you need to grow it if you want to grow it. So let's look at that with a company that's making, let's say, $10,000 a month profit. So a $10,000 a month profit company is making $120,000 a year profit. Um, monthly, if that revenue was, if the profit was to drop by 30%, it would only be making 7000 7, a month instead of 10. Seven is 30% is 30 less than 10. So now we've got seven to work with. Why do I want to think about it in terms of what if there's a drop of 30%? Because things happen in the world. There are pandemics, there are closures, there are supply chains, there are ships that go sideways in the Suez Canal. There's so many things that can happen that can adversely impact the profitability of a business. So let's not assume that everything's gonna go perfect. If it does, great. But if it doesn't and we're not ready for it, that can put us in a bad spot. So now I'm at $7,000 a month. Okay, great. How much do I wanna pay myself? Let's say I wanna pay myself $5,000 a month. Great, okay, that's still there. I take that $5,000 a month out, that leaves me $2,000 a month to grow the company, even if there's a 30% decline in the business. So if I'm happy with $5,000 a month and $2,000 a month to build my growth, then I'm gonna do that deal. But if I'm not, like right now for me, that deal would be, um, a little too small because I, I I want to do bigger deals because my my numbers are you know my needs are are bigger um, and I have good deal flow so I can do that. There's nothing wrong with a smaller deal, but the smaller deals take the same amount of time to do generally as the bigger deals. So I'm gonna you know I'm gonna process that too. Let's say instead it was making a hundred thousand dollars a month profit. Um, I take a thirty percent hit. Now it's making seventy thousand dollars a month profit and. I want to pay myself, let's say $10,000 a month and I want 10,000 a month to grow. Well, now I've still got $50,000 a month profit. I've got 70,000 minus the 10,000 I pay myself minus the 10,000 for growth. That gives me 50K a month or 600,000 a year that I can reinvest in the business or acquiring other businesses, which is also good or in servicing the debt that maybe I incur because I do seller financing and something else. So that I think you just have to look and say, is it gonna cover a decline in business is it also going to pay me the income that I want for dedicating whatever time I'm going to dedicate to it? Is it going to provide the money to grow that I need to grow? And last but not least, will it service whatever debt I might create in the acquisition structure? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's, that's really good. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Excellent, excellent. We have a few more questions coming in. I know we're we're running closer to time here. Uh, Jackie, did you get your question answered? I know you had a question. I, I did. She's good. She's good? All right. Okay. We'll keep yeah, it going. The answer, the answer to Jackie was asking in one of the chats about profit margin. Um, typically, you want at least a 15% to 25% profit margin in the companies that you're looking at. If it's less than that, the risk is pretty high. I've seen deals done as low as 3%, especially in the grocery space. But um, but it's very risky because if anything happens, if you lose a point or two and that represents 67% of your profit, that's pretty significant. So that's the that's the first answer, Jackie. And the second answer would be in terms of compound monthly growth, um, ideally they're looking at like for a really uh, growing business that's going to get the highest of highest of margins, they're looking around a 15% compound uh, monthly growth rate that can be significantly less in more established businesses, but a couple of benchmarks for you. Thank incredible, you so incredible. Thank you, Roland. So this is Roland Frazier. For those of you who just joined, check out WMB, WMB.club. You can read more about him, his new program, which we've taken. I think you said you've done 15 already. I have. Quite yeah, a bit. it's been really fun. Helped thousands and thousands of people, which is absolutely incredible. Um, up next is Troy. Troy, handing it over to you. And if we could all please stick to one question. I know we always say ask my question is, but uh, we want to get to as many people as we can <laughs> because we have about 15-ish minutes left. But Troy, I'm handing it to you. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thank you for asking, Troy. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think, and I'm not exactly sure um, what what that advice was. So tell me if uh, if if mine is different. Um, my my thinking is that you partner or contract or hire your weaknesses. Sarah Blakely, uh, I was talking to her and she said that one of the things that's been really helpful to her, she founded Spanx uh, and is the youngest female billionaire uh, in the history of the Forbes list. Uh, and she said hiring your weaknesses was one of the biggest breakthroughs that she ever had. And I like that. Um, my idea is that, uh, and always has really been, that hiring your weaknesses is great, um, but also something, sometimes it's better to partner. I don't own a controlling interest in any of the businesses that I own. So I have partners in all of my businesses. And my theory there is that by partnering with other people, I have other people who have vested interests in the success of the company. They're not just getting a salary or a, a profit share. They're actually interested in the equity value of the company. And moreover, I mean, more, more than that, I'm also partnered with people who really enjoy doing things that I don't want to do or that I don't enjoy doing. So what that allows me to do is always stay in my area of genius or, um, or expertise or whatever you want to call it and in my area of joy. So I'm not dreading ever doing anything in any of the companies that I own. And the cool thing is, and this is something that, that takes a little bit to get your mind around is that, you know, the thing that you hate doing, there is always somebody that loves it. There's somebody that loves dealing with customer service issues and resolving conflict, right? That sounds awful to me. Uh, I want my customers to be happy and I want the issues to be resolved. But I mean, that sounds like talking to a bunch of unhappy people all day sounds really bad to me. But there are people that really enjoy the and, and experience a reward in working out those problems. There are people that like being on stage and being famous. There are people that like being behind the scenes. There are like people that like numbers and finance. There are people that like sales and marketing, right? So why not only do the things that you like across several companies as opposed to doing everything, including most of the things that you don't like in a single company? Sweet. Incredible, incredible. So Roland, can you dig in before we go to the next question? This back channel feature is really tough to manage, by the way. So sorry, <laughs> if we don't get to your question. It's actually very difficult managing both. Um, but can you give uh, just a quick little download of what is the epic challenge again, so people can know what they what they'll expect? Sure. Yeah. So so for the uh, for the staggering price of fifty five dollars, which we wouldn't charge, except that we've tried it both ways. And we found that when we offer it for free, people do not, and we won't do that again. We tried it one time. Um, but when we offered it for free, um, even though we had thousands of people show up, only about 20% of, I mean, thousands of people sign up, only about 20% of them actually bothered to show up. And that's as someone who's really trying to affect change and, and, and create a movement of people doing this, um, it's frustrating to not have people vested in their own success. So I ask you to make a small investment of $55 in your success and show up and do this stuff because I know that if you do, it works as you've heard from lots of people here and as I've heard from hundreds and hundreds of people who have. So what, what the EPIC stands for ethical profits in crisis. We had a, a crisis that was the pandemic, but we have a bigger crisis, actually three of them that are going on right now in the world of business. The first is that there are uh, millions and millions of baby boomers who are aging out of their businesses. About 12.5 million baby boomers that own businesses in the United States over the next 10 years need to move out of their business. They're just getting older and they just can't continue to have that. They're, they're dying or they're uh, wanting to pass their wealth on, not in the form of the business, but in terms of money to other people, or they just want to relocate or they're just tired. And so there's a, a, a decade plus of this transition that's going to continue to happen. The, the other crisis that goes hand in hand with that is that there is no efficient market for the sale 
of small businesses. There are efficient markets for the sale of interests in large businesses. We call those stock exchanges for publicly held companies. But for private companies, there are sites like Biz Buy Sell and, and dozens and dozens of others in, in different countries that have a tiny sliver of all of the people who want to sell their business on there. And only about 20% of all of the businesses that ever get listed on these business for sale sites or, or by brokers actually sell, meaning 80% of the businesses that ever even get listed still don't sell. So, so that's what's going on. So to me, it's this, these ethical, we, we have this dilemma of, um, of these crises that are going on right now. And there is the ability to make ethical profits, not going in and being predatory and saying, I'll give you a dollar for your business. It's going in and saying, tell me what you want for your business and let me see if we can create a situation where I can get you what you want, we can actually collaborate as opposed to negotiate. There isn't a loser or winner here. We're both going to win. You want to sell your business and you want to get X for it. I'm going to try to get you that and I'm going to do it in a way that allows the business to pay for itself. And there are millions of situations where you can do that, right? So, so epic, the epic challenge walks people through the process of what is this opportunity that exists right now in a little bit more detail? What, and it's over five days, how do you identify these businesses? How do you find the businesses that are for sale? How do you analyze the businesses so that you can say, this is one that makes sense and this is what I should probably be willing to pay for it and this is the process of collaborating? What do you do to find the owners of the business specifically? Because finding the business is only step one. You also have to find out who is it that owns it. What do you say to those people in the conversations that you're going to have with scripts and templates so that you can communicate with them in a way that you will be comfortable with, but also that will enable you to get to buy their business? And then how do you fund it with no money out of pocket? So we do that over a five-day period. And at the end, you have everything that you need to be able to do this. We do also offer at the end the ability to go deeper and have access to all of the different ways that we do this, but you don't have to do that. That's really important to me. I don't like bait and switch. I don't like incomplete um, programs. I like programs that will say, hey, you invest your $55 with me, you spend your five days with me, and I'll show you how this works. Obviously, I can't show you 40 years of work in five days. Um, and if you want to go deep, you can too, but you don't have to. So that's really what it's about. Incredible. In wow. Oh. And when is that going to, when is the start of the first day, Roland? It starts on the, on Thursday, which let me pull my little calendar up, which I think is the 29th, uh, but I will verify. Yeah, it starts on the 29th of this month. And so it'll be the 29th and 30th. And then uh, the following Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, second, uh, third, and fourth of August. Yes, Dan, what is the site? Go ahead. WMB.club. Easy. Three letters. WMB. What it takes to run a $1 million biz. WMB.club. Check it out. I can't tell you how many messages I just got around people that this is like your epic community, but on Clubhouse right now. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. That's incredible. Um I have a couple more people here. Eric Samdahl, and this is just order of people who had messaged me, but Eric Samdahl, you want to jump in? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Dan. That's awesome. It was. <laughs> yeah, so so the for me, most of the deals come from people that I have done deals with before. As you do this more and more, your network builds up. But really it's it's for me primarily network. I, I don't advertise for deals um, because uh, I, I am sharing information and content all the time about 
what I'm learning and what I'm finding. And I have the benefit of thousands of people in the Epic community now that, that we can do deals with. So the community itself is uh, a huge source of deals because we've done, we've had tens of thousands of people that have gone through the program now who are um, all able to connect in the community once they go through and they're collaborating with each other. And so there's a lot of deal flow that comes from there. Um, I also get a lot of deal flow from uh, doing things like this, where I share information and help other people. I'm constantly making myself available to help other people on social and sharing content as well. And then I speak at events from time to time. And, and uh, this week, actually, it's been kind of interesting. It's like, hey, events are back because Monday I did a virtual event with Chris Crohn's mastermind group. And um, I had somebody from there that reached out to uh, to do something. I then on Tuesday spoke for Steve Sims, who's a really brilliant guy um, uh, who had a thing called the Speakeasy, about 50 people downtown San Diego. I spoke there. I had two of those people reach out wanting to do a deal. And then tomorrow I'm speaking at my friend Greg Reed's mastermind at his home with about 40 or 50 people. And my guess is something will come from there. So uh, to me, it's just being out there and telling people. But, um, but I've had things come from my email signature. I've had things come from my podcast. Um, I've had things. I've uh, had things come from referrals. Uh, I've and, and and I've had people who are doing deals that have had things come from their kids or their sister or their brother or just. It's a lot of it is just putting yourself out there and letting people know that you're doing or interested in doing this kind of thing. Perfect. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Roland. I know we're out of time. And I know you stayed an extra 30 minutes. So thank you so much. So just tell everybody where they can find you in case they want to know more about you. Sure. Well, the, the best place, I'll let you give that link again. That's going to be the best place to get involved and get yourself taking action as soon as possible. Oh, and by the way, we actually had Steve Sims on July 5th. It oh, was incredible. That's great. Yeah, Steve is an awesome guy. Yes. And Dr. Reed. Yeah, we had him on as well. So nice. uh, amazing community. But thank you very much for being here. Let's all get off our microphones here and just thank Roland. Everyone, thank you so much. This <laughs> is the best. Thank you so much, Roland. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. Thank you, Roland. Appreciate you. So if you want to find out more, yeah, if you want to find out more, go to WMB.club. Check it out. Roland Frazier, an incredible, incredible person. Now, after everyone speaks, I know you have to go. We always do a quick download, 15-minute download. So we're just going to talk amongst ourselves. And what do we learn? What are we going to implement? But again, 